Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look now and take some time for him. I know cut trees with paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yeah, it's time for him. Oh, an acre of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. Well, right now, it's time for hemp. Thank you for taking time for hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to the live broadcast of Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio. And of course, timeforhemp.com. Big shout out to KDK Distributors for being nice enough to give us a grant to keep us loud, proud, and strong. And our love to all of our listeners up in Kananda. We appreciate you tuning in. Thursday is the day, and we've got a lot to talk about. We put a spotlight on what's happening here in the United States because what happens here has a big impact on the rest of the world especially when it comes to drug policy. And uh, we always have as our joint host on Thursdays, Paul Stanford. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Casper. How are you today? Fine, thank you. It rocks having you as part of our family. Also, I want to say thank you for your additional support, support of the network. Without your help, we would have gone under. And uh, your love and contributions to this Network has kept the voice of about 25 people loud, proud, and strong. And I should tell you and our joint guest today that uh, we've got uh, Doug McVeigh on the the network now every Tuesday and Thursday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. before this broadcast. Also joining us starting next Tuesday is Kevin Zeiss. He's bringing his programming to the network Clearing the fog, Kevin is one of the founders of the marijuana movement. He was a co-founder of the Drug Policy Foundation, which later became the Drug Policy Alliance. And starting the last Monday of this month, then every Monday and Wednesday, we will have a Japanese version of Time for Hemp going all around the world. And because of Paul Stanford's support of this network and the support of our sponsors, we're able to do that. So thank you, Paul for raising the voice globally of the marijuana movement. You are very welcome, Casper. I try to do as much as I can. I know uh, we've got a couple of guests I was able to help for a while, hopefully. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a mutual benefit. We're you're getting our word out. We're getting each other's word out. So, you know, I'm a thousand percent behind our cause. But you've got a couple of great guests today. Do you want to introduce them? We sure do. Members of our family. Chris Conrad was the very, very, very first ever interview done on the Time for Hemp project. I call it a project because it's evolved into so many different phases. But on the very first television series that was broadcast, January yeah, 5th, that 1991. Yeah, great show, Casper. And I'm glad to see you're keeping the tradition alive here uh, on the Time for Hemp. It's expanding to a network. And also, of course, uh, I've got the Leaf Radio Show every uh, Monday at 4 p.m. here on this very same network. So uh, hopefully your, your listeners today will tune in and, and hear us there also every Monday at 4 o'clock with uh, Jeremy Dawn. And Leaf you've been Radio. working many years in the movement with uh, your better half in so many different ways, Mickey Norris. Good morning, Mickey. Good morning, Casper. Hi, Paul. Good to be here. Howdy. Now, you guys just came back from an overseas trip, which was pretty exciting, didn't you? We certainly did. It was fantastic. We managed to do a tour of South America, which is uh, on the forefront of change right now. And, in fact, while we were there, they had the world's largest uh, global marijuana march ever, 150,000 people in Buenos Aires, although we weren't there for that, actually. We were in Chile at the time, but because we hit Uruguay, uh, Argentina, and uh, Chile in uh, kind of a streak across the continent down in the south. First time in the Andes, uh, first time doing uh, networking in Chile, and, and I think it was uh, amazing. I'm ready to talk to you more about that. Mickey, what do you got to say? It was just a fantastic trip. We did a four-week speaking and networking tour. We attended lots of conferences, spoke at um, 
really in important places. Um, in Uruguay, we we attended a conference, a medical marijuana conference, which was interesting because uh, they, you know, recently just legalized cannabis for adult use, and now they're looking at how are they going to bring in the medical uses at, at, as a different uh, program. And we spoke up at the Ministry of Education and Culture and did presentations before prosecutors and lawyers and judges there, which was very important and already had an impact, according to uh, some of our activist friends there who told us that Chris's um, talk about the way cannabis is, is cultivated and how much people use had an impact on somebody recently just getting arrested and was discharged or dismissed, I should say. And uh, we spoke at the, sorry about, sorry about the phone calls here, we've got a home office that, that, uh, that is ringing away here. But um, we also spoke at the National Congress and uh, the city hall in Buenos Aires, and we spoke at various universities and La Plata and um, Rosario, the second largest city in Buenos Aires. And we we spoke at a university also in, in Chile and, and did some radio and print media uh, interviews. And it was just really a fantastic trip, very worthwhile. And it was so energizing to us to see the new energy of, of, a, of a new movement uh, jumping on, on board with the, the legalization train, I guess, and uh, with lots of, actually generated by the home growing movement, the home cultivators. And it was just so exciting to be there. They were just eating up the information. They were so hungry for information there. There's not a lot of, um, aside from what they get on the internet, there weren't a lot of um, things going on there. So it helped to bring the, their activists together as well to put on these conferences for us. And, and it was just really gratifying being there and so fun meeting all these great cannabis activists who were there uh, and we were there during uh, their harvest season, which was also very nice uh, because uh, they were flush in cannabis there while we were there. And they were happy to, to, to show what they had compared to what normally is available in those countries, which is part of Wajo, Paraguayan cannabis, which is the, the major exporter of their uh, street uh, cannabis there from Paraguay that supplies a lot of the countries in South America with cannabis. So it was just a really fantastic trip for me personally. It was just very energizing and inspiring as well. You know, and, and I think one of the things that, that was uh, pretty uh, impressive down there is this nexus you were talking about, Casper, between the changes happening in the U.S. and the changes happening down there uh, in, in South America. Because, uh, you know, I think this year is going to go down in history as, as one of the turning point years in this issue, of course, uh, between Uruguay uh, legalizing marijuana for the first time uh, of any country. Then you've got, uh, of course, Colorado beginning uh, legal sales of marijuana without federal harassment. Then we have the uh, industrial hemp bill that got through Congress and the, the planting of hemp in uh, Kentucky. And we've got the Congress, uh, the House of Representatives voting uh, to penalize the DEA for abusing their authority and going after medical marijuana. Um, and, and of course, you know, we have the, the obstacle at the uh, Senate because these guys don't really represent us in the Senate or that much in the House. Uh, you know, they've got their other agendas that they're pursuing. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that when you look at that many changes uh, happening in the United States and in other countries simultaneously, in fact, the uh, president of Chile is expected to hopefully sign a uh, bill that will uh, reschedule marijuana down in that country as well uh, this year. So, you know, uh, and when we're down there, a lot of times they were talking about the excitement about what was happening in, in Washington and Colorado, and we we're talking about the excitement for us of what's going on in Uruguay. So, like you said, this nexus of energy back and forth between the countries is really important. And uh, one thing I would caution people, though, is if they think they're going to go to Uruguay and, uh, and go into a coffee shop like in Amsterdam to buy marijuana, they're going to be uh, disappointed. 
because not only is there not a system in place, uh, but the system, when it is in place, is designed for uh, locals uh, that don't have uh, any, currently they don't have a plan to provide for tourists. And so, uh, you know, a lot of Americans are thinking going down to, to Uruguay and checking it out, and they think they're going to be, find a very open scene. Uh, you can smoke anywhere, so it's open to that extent. But as far as actually getting marijuana, they don't have it set up for tourists to get it, and currently the plan is to not do that. Their plan is really, as Mickey said, to make uh, marijuana legally available at a price that is cheaper than the drug cartels can afford and thereby uh, undercut any desire for anybody to have a black market. But yet at the same time, by not providing to tourists, I think they're going to create their own black market because people, you know, the tourists are coming down there, they're going to be looking for marijuana. You know, their system is akin to what the United Nations Legal Con uh, Convention Treaty requires. You know, they the, the Single Convention Treaty outlines a, a series of protocols that uh, cannabis can be provided on a medical or scientific uh, basis. And so the, the laws, of course, that have been passed in Washington and Colorado don't address that. Our model in Oregon did. We, we implemented, uh, you know, but we lost in November 2012, but it would have implemented a, a system that uh, was in compliance with the international treaties, uh, and we specifically designed it that way. Of course, you know, we're going forward with a slightly revised version of that this time, and Alaska is already on the ballot. We have three different cannabis initiatives, and I'm behind two of those here in Oregon that are currently going for the vote. And then, of course, uh, they say this summer Washington State's first retail stores will open up, and the Seattle Hemp Fest, an event you, know, you guys and we like to go to, it uh, is working with the city to establish a smoking and a non-smoking section. So that'll be an interesting development, don't you think? Totally. Is I said a non-smoking section of the city or just an, uh, within a building? Because that would be kind of tricky. <laughs> I, I think I'd have to move into be, the smoking section of the city, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to be really difficult to to get the thousands and thousands of people who attend Seattle Hempfest to get the message. I mean, they're, they're going to give it a good effort, I'm sure, to, to comply. As I know they're going to try to exclude minors from... The, uh, the smoking area, of course. And so, you know, we are running into that same issue with our, our Portland Hemp Stock Festival. And at this time, let me just extend another invitation for you guys to come back to that. We're going to back to Portland's Tom McCall Waterfront Park this year in downtown Portland. Uh, we haven't had our event there in about eight years. We've been out in a, uh, more pastoral setting at the confluence of the, uh, Willamette and Columbia River. And uh, the parking out there was a nightmare. There were a lot of logistic problems. Now we're moving back into Portland's front yard for this year's Infest. But we had a lot of blowback from the Port of Portland police out there on the river and the regular Portland Police Bureau. And so uh, we'll have a much stricter security requirements at this year's Hemp Stock Festival as well. But uh, we're jumping through the hoops required by, you know, this new regulatory environment. What's the date of the uh, hemp stock this year? It's September 27th and 28th. They oh. moved us back three weeks oh. from what okay. the date that we have traditionally held our event on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's when this park was available. And uh, as I said, the City Parks Bureau and uh, the Portland Police opposed it. We had to go before the mayor and the city council, and we got the mayor on our side, working with the city council member to establish all the protocols that the police require, extra security, mm -hmm. checking everybody's bags going in, you know, mm -hmm. and other stipulations. You know, we were, we've were we been talking to the people up at uh, Seattle Hempfest as well, and uh, this is where legalization is making their situation a little more awkward, is that the, uh, the city now wants them to designate smoking area or a smoking area at the uh, Hemp Fest. And, of course, as you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, I at said. At 420 so at the Hemp Fest, they're smoking everywhere. Problematic. 
Yeah, and, and yeah. so in, in a way, like uh, what they're suggesting is they don't think the police would come in uh, picketing or rounding up people, but just telling them yeah. where the smoking area is and that this is part of a phasing in of the concept of the smoking area versus the non-smoking area, uh, you know, which is, uh, is, which is kind of like – one thing I would like to mention, though, is that we were in Uruguay. Uh, they don't have any regulations on uh, uh, smoking tobacco or, or marijuana. So people are walking around the streets, you know, smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana outside of buildings. Um, I, don't remember, I don't remember smoking a lot, of, a lot of smoking inside of restaurants or anything like that. Maybe Mickey can correct me about no, it. I don't think they, they allow smoking in the restaurant. Uh, but anyway, I just think that uh, it, it was very interesting to be in a country where it was kind of free, you know what I mean? And we were there and there were people smoking cigarettes around us and smoking marijuana us, and we didn't go crazy, we didn't get sick and die. You know, Americans are so afraid of, of everything, but it, it, the secondhand smoke thing is just insane in this country. And it was just kind of actually nice to be in a country where people were smoking actually even not only marijuana publicly, but cigarettes publicly, <laughs> you know, and, and not getting uh, shat upon for it. So, uh, you know, I think America could, could actually learn a little bit back from them that you know we don't really have to be afraid of what other people are doing around us as much as we are this whole thing about and it just amazes me uh, also on the secondhand smoke issue since I'm on a bandwagon for a second here is that all these towns that are saying they want to be smoke free and they're banning even e-cigarettes which are not smoke just to show you how hysterical they are but then they, they, what are they doing about the cars driving in and out that is smoke that is toxic that is fumes yeah. that is you know poison uh, but you know so if they're so anti smoking they should be going after cars you know and i drive so i'm not saying that is you know as a facetious thing i'm saying if they're really concerned about the health of people that's what they should be going after and this nonsense about going after people because somebody 20 yards away might be smoking a cigarette that somehow is supposed to corrupt my life that is just uh, authoritarian authoritarianism in my opinion it doesn't have anything to do with health and has everything to do with just telling people how to live their lives uh, which is something our government likes to do i notice well, one thing I got to put a spotlight on is our sponsors. That's how we stay afloat here on the big network. Then we're going to listen to a song about how fantastic marijuana is called Yearning for the Herb. And then come back and pick up where we left off here at Time for Hemp. Listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastrointestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. In need of a ganja vacation? Blaze away. Don't criticize it. Hotbox Jamaica. Chill. Legalize it. Relax and burn all day while watching the amazing ocean view. Listen to the birds. Bathe in the mineral waters of the Ganja River. Munch on tasty Jamaican Rasta food. Take a weed farm tour and hold a meditation. Book this amazing vacation for $420. Get the Sativa Special. Seven nights in Sativa dorms with Ganja meals and airport transfer. Check us out at hotboxjamaica.com. That's hotboxjamaica.com. 
Hotbox Jamaica, a higher meditation vacation. Indigo is your source for affordable induction grow lighting. First discovered in 1891 by Nikola Tesla, Indigo lights deliver 11 years of electronic sunlight to your plants. Indigo lamps require less than half the power of traditional HID lamps. Converting to Indigo lights means you'll cut down on your power bill with less lighting. Indigo lamps also use five times less mercury than traditional fluorescent or HID lamps, making Indigo not only energy efficient but environmentally friendly as well. No more switching out lamps between vegetative and flowering stages. As nature intended, your lights get a steady dose of UV light that makes your plants grow healthier and stronger. Indigo products are manufactured in San Diego, California, and come with a written 10-year warranty. What Tesla knew, then growers know now, is that Indigo lighting is the cost-effective addition to your victory garden. To learn more or order now, go to inda-grow.com. That's i-n-d-a-g-r-o.com, or call 877-452-2244 to answer any of your questions. These guys really know lights. Indigo really is your sunlight in a box. Education and information. See what all the buzz is all about. It's time for hemp. It's time for hemp. Wake up, wake up in the morning, got the yearning for herb. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Wake, up, wake up in the morning, got the yearning for herb. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get up one time for your mind If you're going to the show You know we're gonna get high off the music You know we're loving how we use it For the positive and the spiritual But some don't hear me though It's something beautiful Something make you feel so fine To calm and ease my mind I spent time under the influence And I remember that day when you first came across my way And though I didn't really know what to say I loved the way that I was introduced to it Yeah, 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 yeah up in the morning i get the yearning for herb i want to thank you for tuning in to time for hemp live all around the world like a good joint we're best when you share us with your friends please make it a point to make 
that happen. We are a team of people raising the voice of the marijuana movement, letting the world know how insane these prohibition policies are. In the news, it's rather interesting. A friend of ours by the name of Ethan Nadelman has written an article and stated that for 40 years or for four decades, the Drug Enforcement Administration has systematically obstructed medical research and rejected scientific evidence. It is increasingly clear that entrusting decisions involving medical science to the DEA is akin to leaving the fox in charge of the hen house. And what's more striking is how little scrutiny the DEA has faced from Congress or other federal overseers. Wednesday of this week, members of Congress, scientific experts, medical marijuana patients, and others joined in a teleconference that accompanied the release of a new report co-published by MAPS organization and the Drug Policy Alliance called the DEA. Four decades of impeding and rejecting science. And may I say that since the days of the Nixon administration, federal officials have described the drug classification process as based on science and evidence. But the DEA's actions strongly indicate that their decision-making process has everything to do with politics and little to do with science. On the program, my joint host and my joint guest, Shirley, not only agree with those statements, but will echo the comments made by Ethan Nadelman, Paul Stanford, Chris Conrad, Mickey Norris, founders of the marijuana movement here on Time for Hemp. Paul, open the questions to you so that Mickey and Chris can share with the world the information that they so need. Well, uh, so tell me more. Were you there at that march in Argentina with uh, 150,000 people, Mickey and Chris? No, we, unfortunately, we had already left Argentina when the Global Marijuana March took place. So we joined the the marchers in San Felipe, um, Chile, which was actually very interesting being there because that was, they call the cradle of the, of the hemp in, in that area. Um, in that area, there was like the first, I believe, Chris, it was the first um, The place first recorded in, place where hemp was planted in the, quote, New World by the Spanish in 1545, that just uh, 50 years after Columbus landed, they were recorded as growing hemp there. Yeah, so it really is the first place that, we know. That's is that the region that Michael Bafari Yes, uh, we were Place there. Where Michael right? Bafari's been talking about. You went? Did you go there with him? Oh yeah. Another we, hip host on uh, time for him here on their spent network. We a lot of time with Mike Bafari when we were in South America. He helped to arrange the the Argentina and Chile portions of our trip for us with um, for the for the conferences and some of the media, and it was really wonderful, Mike was very excited about San Felipe and what's going on there. They're gearing up to have an exhibition to um, like some kind of public information exhibit there in July with pairing with the uh, municipality there in order to bring back some of the history, recent history, I must say, because they were growing hemp there until the 1970s when when Pinochet uh, actually wiped it out with his dictatorship there. But um, it was very interesting um, to be there. We went to a local museum that showed pictures of a hemp factory and and the bales of hemp. And we saw newspaper articles of of people advertising all their hemp for sale. and, And so it was just very interesting marching there. But it's a smaller town, and but they do have a movement there. So our march was only a few hundred people, but it was spirited. We marched through the streets, and uh, it it was just a great being there. And and the activists there are all all very excited, and they're interested in in the hemp. And a lot of the young people there don't, you know, it's before their time that hemp was growing, but uh, they're going to to get a a lesson soon on the history, and they're, they're hoping to bring it back. 
uh, now the the hemp there has been replaced by a lot of vineyards, uh, and Chile is now known for their wine. They've got a very rich soil there and lots of fruits and vegetables, so it's really great to to be there uh, as opposed to um, some other parts of South America. It was hard for me uh, to to uh, be stay on my diet of rich in fruits and vegetables these days because they're very meat-centric, and uh, they've got great meat, grass-fed meat, which is, which is nice for, for people when they go there. But, um, yeah, we, we spent that time there. Um, the last part of our trip was in Chile, so unfortunately we didn't get to, to go and experience that huge, giant march through the streets in Buenos Aires with un- over 100 That would have been something. There. But the, uh, back in the Chile, Seattle thing, upset. What's that? Except it's it was a, a that would be something it, as big as the Seattle. the Seattle upset. Well, the Seattle upset. They say that that's what they get over the weekend. This is in one day, a few hours. So it's pretty yeah. impressive. And but, it's also yeah. moving through the city. I bet. Mm-hmm. So, so but getting back to this other question, though, uh, that ties into what Cass was saying about the DEA. Um, you know, the, the hemp was being grown until the 1970s in uh, Chile, uh, and then the United States sponsored the overthrow of the government, the coup, by um, which is interesting how we're so against coups. But at the time, we were sponsoring coups, and uh, the one we sponsored in Chile included Pinochet uh, taking over. And one of the things that was cut as a deal there was that the DEA got him to ban industrial hemp as well as marijuana, which goes to one of these major lies that the DEA has perpetuated it itself, um, you know, which is that the hemp and marijuana are the same and you can't tell the differences. So they took that particular lie down to, uh, to Chile and got them to ban a major industry. And now, as Mickey said, a lot of that area is growing um, grapes. And as you may or may not grow, grapes are very water intensive. So they're having these uh, droughts going on. The same drought that's hitting the west coast of the United States is also hitting the west coast of South America. And, uh, and, and so this is one of the reasons why hemp is looking favorable to them as well, is that uh, you know, they, they can't keep growing grapes. Their, their water supply is not good enough for it. But if they get back to hemp, then they could have another product that would not only just give them an export crop, but give them something that uh, they can build homes with and so forth, which is, of course, quite important there. And, um, you know, I, I think also on the DEA subject, uh, since that was what uh, you were reading a minute ago, Casper, I think that I, I give the DEA a certain sort of a perverted credit. Uh, you know, they are perverted, obviously, and they pervert science. But the perverted credit I give to them is that, uh, you know, the uh, – they have actually gotten Congress to do some good stuff for us. For example, in 2001, they tried to ban hemp foods. And, uh, and uh, because they were trying to override the authority of Congress and rewrite the definition of marijuana, they got this negative reaction, and they were specifically blocked from implementing that policy of banning hemp foods. Um, and so actually, hemp foods are in a more uh, secure position now as a result of the DEA's attempt to suppress them than it was before because it was in a state where it wasn't exactly sure. But once the DEA uh, defied Congress and Congress reacted, then then now it's quite clear that hemp foods are legal. And the other thing is that um, I, a lot of – well, I, I don't know. I shouldn't say a lot, but at least some people I'm talking to think that the DEA's move to seize and steal the hemp seeds that were being imported into uh, Kentucky – after the uh, the federal government passed the farm bill this year, allowing for hemp to be grown, then Kentucky moved forward to do it, and then the DEA interjected itself in the middle of it and tried to actually stop this from happening after Congress had voted to allow it to happen, and the Kentucky government did. Uh, then right soon after that, then we get Congress for the first time voting to trim the clip their wings a little bit, uh, at least in the House of Representatives. And so uh, I, I think in a, in a way the DEA has gotten itself in a position now where they're so loathed and despised and reviled among the population. Uh, and at the same time, Congress is getting fed up with them as well. Uh, and so what, as they continue to do their overreach, reacting more and more uh, desperately to the fact that they are losing the drug war. And, of course, we've all heard that audio of the DEA agent kind of crying to Congress that he's so afraid that marijuana will be legalized because he loses his job. Oh, he didn't say about losing his job, did he? Uh, but in any case, that is what he was so afraid of. This was quite obvious when you hear him talking about all these DEA agents who are afraid of legalization. Um, that, you know, that there's, as they become more, um, uh, more uh, 
marginalized on this issue that the more they try to do overreach, I think it's going to be biting them uh, in the butt. The problem we have, of course, keeps coming back to the Senate. Like here in California, our major, our, our senior senator, Dianne Feinstein, she should just, I say, you know, Di Fi should say bye bye because she has no real connection to the voters of California anymore, except for the fact that we get stuck voting her back into office because of the lack of um, any meaningful opposition. But, you know, it, it's like during the Iraq war, the vast majority of Californians were against that war, and she voted to get us into that war. And that blood is on her hands, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, when it comes to saving the environment, she's always there to save about a fifth as much as we want to save at about five times the price, like she did with the Headwaters Project, which she claims is her big victory. But, in fact, she sold it out. Uh, we got a fourth of the property, and we paid ten times the, the value of the entire property. And that was her rescue. It was actually a rescue for the logging industry, not for the, this. And then when you come to uh, this latest thing about the, the cutting of funding for the DEA, once again, we have Feinstein out there saying she's against it, even though 80 percent of Californians support it. So the question is, who is she representing, and why is she still in office, and why doesn't she resign? Uh, those are the three questions that I have. And, and the sooner she's out, the better, as far as I'm concerned. She is one Democrat that uh, I will certainly be opposing on every step of the way uh, because she has shown that she doesn't stand for California at all. She stands for her own uh, vested interests. And this is the thing that's so terrible about this drug war is the way it's corrupted our political process to where these politicians with their moralistic uh, baloney, uh, you know, are able to uh, bring prejudice and bigotry into the American system um, without any repercussions uh, because of the money involved in our political process today. And uh, it'll be great when hemp money starts pouring into this process. And, and I think we're going to see that with Kentucky putting out the first crop. Within a few years, we're going to have some hemp magnets who will be able to donate and make some changes. Well, I sure hope they focus on this network. We're getting ready to pay our bills, but we could use not only a few donations to go to the timeforhemp.com website and hit the donate button, but we're always, always excited to bring on new sponsors. So if you've got a product or a service that you would like to bring to the attention of the global marijuana movement, let them know about it here on Time for Hemp. <laughs> Listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. If you are in the Portland, Oregon area and are an OMMP cardholder, then come down to Nikki's Diggity Dank Market, Portland, Oregon's first and only weekly OMMP market, presented by the Alternative Wellness Center, located at 5241 Southeast 72nd Avenue, two blocks south of Foster Boulevard, close to public transportation, held every Sunday, 10 a.m. till 7 p.m., connecting quality vendors with patients. Nikki's Diggity Dank Market also has a weekly raffle with products from every vendor. So come down to Nikki's Diggity Dank Market and have fun while connecting with quality vendors and getting great natural medicine. If you are a vendor and want a chance to connect with OMMP patients, you can check out their Facebook page at facebook.com slash alternative wellness center or call 971-888-4392. Be sure to register early because space is limited. Nikki's Diggity Dank Market. In need of a ganja vacation? Blaze away. Don't criticize me. Hotbox Jamaica. Chill. Relax and burn all day while watching the amazing ocean view. Listen to the birds. Bathe in the mineral waters of the Ganja River. Munch on tasty Jamaican Rasta food. Take a weed farm tour and hold a meditation. Book this amazing vacation for $420. Get the Sativa Special. Seven nights in sativa dorms with ganja meals and airport transfer. Check us out at hotboxjamaica.com. 
That's hotboxjamaica.com. Hotbox Jamaica, a higher meditation vacation. Indigo is your source for affordable induction grow lighting. First discovered in 1891 by Nikola Tesla, Indigo lights deliver 11 years of electronic sunlight to your plants. Indigo lamps require less than half the power of traditional HID lamps. Converting to Indigo lights means you'll cut down on your power bill with less lighting. Indigo lamps also use five times less mercury than traditional fluorescent or HID lamps, making Indigo not only energy efficient but environmentally friendly as well. No more switching out lamps between vegetative and flowering stages. As nature intended, your lights get a steady dose of UV light. That makes your plants grow healthier and stronger. Indigo products are manufactured in San Diego, California and come with a written 10-year warranty. What Tesla knew, then growers know now, is that Indigo lighting is the cost-effective addition to your victory garden. To learn more or order now, go to inda-grow.com. That's inda-gro.com. Or call 877-452-2244 to answer any of your questions. These guys really know lights. Indigo really is your sunlight in a box. Free? Did you say free? Free hemp? Free hemp? Free hemp video and audio? Free downloads of all the top artists, all the pot artists on planet Earth. Interviews with all the people making the movement, making the hemp movement. It's time for hemp. That's right, world. It's time for hemp. That's right, world. It's time for him. Well, I went and had a bowl. Good green reefer. Big fat don't be much, much sweeter. Hide it, don't hide it. Hide it, don't hide it. Just hide it, don't hide it. Hide it, don't hide it. Well, I don't hide it. Fire it up right now. Yeah, baby, fire up right now. Be loud, proud, and strong. And come out of the closet and stand shoulder to shoulder with us in this foxhole on the front lines in the war on drugs. It is coming to an end. The other side is slowly but surely having to pack their muzzles and pack their suitcases and duffel bags and climb onto their little airplanes and fly back to their bases and go back to civilian life. And those members of the DEA, Homeland Security, and the FBI. Well, we know you're listening, so pay attention. Get your resumes together and bring them to Portland, Oregon. Paul Stanford will be happy to hire you to help get signatures <laughs> to put onto the ballot the uh, initiative that he's working on. Paul, tell people about that. Let the DEA yeah. know that you will at least give them first preference, right? <laughs> oh, certainly. Certainly. You know, we've gone to the point now where we're paying... Uh, Daily, we've got 21 days from today to qualify for a vote. All petitions have to be in by July 3rd. That's one of the things I'm doing is carrying some materials between Portland and uh, Bend, Oregon right now. Um, and so uh, uh, we're mounting, uh, uh, you know, our final effort to make the ballot for our two initiatives. Uh We've actually brought in about 7,000 donors here in Oregon who have given about $170,000 to help push this forward. Of course, I've donated more than that through our clinics. And then uh, uh, this fellow uh, with the Foundation for Constitutional Protection out of Austin, Texas, has also donated about $100,000 to our efforts. And so uh, we're hiring people. We're paying $15 an hour. Uh, the, the, a bonus based on meeting certain production goals, and we're paying people daily between now and the end of our petition drive. We hope that motivates people so they can get out there and turn your signatures in today and get paid tomorrow. So uh, for more information, you can go to hemp.org, H-E-M-P dot O-R-G, or call our office at 503-235-46. Zero six. We have two initiatives we're working on. One would amend Oregon's constitution to say that people have a right to possess and grow their own cannabis and the state can regulate it for public safety reasons. The other one's a statutory measure and uh, uh, it would regulate it and raise public revenue on the sales to adults over the counter. 
So for more information, go to hemp.org. That runs, and I also know that in California, as the uh, uh, Office of the DEA and Homeland Security begins to lay off their troops and send them home, they can find jobs in your state too, right, Mickey? Right, Chris? Well, probably not passing petitions at this point. And uh, the petitioners, I, I think it's kind of interesting you're paying by the hour, Paul, because people out here are uh, usually paying by the signature. So uh, Oregon yeah, law, Oregon law requires that you pay by the hour. In fact, this fellow got fined $65,000 last year for paying by the signature. There was an initiative. We're challenging that in federal court, actually. But there's an initiative that passed several years ago that says you cannot pay petitioners by the signature. You have to pay them by the hour, and they're pretty heavy penalties. I think this guy who got the, the $65,000 fine is just based on about 15 signature sheets oh. and they find him $5,000 per sheet. Oh my gosh. Well, oh, yeah. Do you, do you have to be an Oregon yeah. voter to, to uh, collect Circulate? Signatures? No, you do not. Uh, in fact, we even had a BBC reporter come out and circulate the petition a few years back for uh, a program over in, uh, in England on the BBC. But uh, anyone can circulate, but only Oregon registered voters can sign the petition. Well, and I wasn't so much focusing in California as far as petition signing. It's my understanding that the uh, new laws and changes in California and Washington and Oregon and Colorado are creating a huge new industry that's stimulating tax dollars and new jobs. Isn't that right? There, there is a green rush. And, in fact, uh, I have signed paperwork to take my own company public. And I know there was a... Uh, and and we're bringing in some pretty massive investment, but the, the that won't be available for a few more uh, uh, an OTC stock. But there are conferences talking about the investment possibilities. One happened up in Vancouver, BC, about a month ago. They call it a green rush. Have you heard that term, Chris or Mickey? The green G-R-E-A-M? rush. Green. No. Uh, green. Yeah. Green, we've like heard the color. We've heard in terms green. of an investment. An investment uh, uh, opportunity right now in the nascent and developing cannabis industry. It's a new industry. I mean, or it's a growing industry. <laughs> no pun intended, but that's true. It, you know, it, it 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 does have the most potential of something that we've seen that we haven't seen in in, in a long time of of a, of a brand new industry that. It's full of potential for all, a lot of revenue for for the states. For there are the major jobs. investment companies, yeah. major investment companies. There's one New York-based one that uh, controls 250 billion dollars in assets that mm-hmm. Willie Nelson and I are both working on developing brands with. And time will tell where that comes out, but uh, they are a, a very large player. And Willie and I are both working together to develop some some Willie Nelson-based cannabis brand for the market. And uh, uh, that's a completely separate thing from our company going public. We're working with a group of international uh, financiers that just uh, uh, have been helping us lately. And so uh, we just signed the papers a couple of weeks ago, and we're we're having our corporate... uh, Financial records audited, and we'll have a stock available on the OTC market here in the next two or three months. And this is actually the first place I've announced that. Oh well, good luck. There's there's also quite a green rush going on in the Uruguay. People are going there. When we were there, we saw people from all over the place trying to cash in on on the the new environment there, but. Uh, they may they may find it a little more difficult than they they think because their their system there is is, is going to be very very regulated. But people we saw that were going there were looking for places where they can do research in an environment. Um, but their their system in Uruguay is going to be very regulated. They're going to be they're controlling to the point that they're controlling the strains that can be legally grown and 
where it's sold through the pharmacies for a dollar a gram. And they only want to allow five strains to be available through their pharmacies. And then people who are doing home growing can register their own strain. But people, when we were there, uh, we saw people who were looking to do some CBD trials there um, because they felt the environment there was more open than it was in the U.S. There, there's still so many obstacles here to research. And um, it was just, it was just uh, quite the environment there, Chris. Do you have something to add to that? Oh, and, and also the, um, when getting back to the, 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 um, the impedance of science here in the United States and in Uruguay, they were looking to the scientists for their answers on how to go forward. And they felt, you know, they might not get it right the first time, and, and how they're they're approaching their regulations that they feel they it's so important to go forward now and not waste time and tweak it as they go. It was very refreshing to see the openness to to all the the science there. Yeah, it was also interesting to be talking with government officials who are interested in making it work because you know at California here we've had legal marijuana uh, medical marijuana for seventeen eighteen how many years is it sixteen years. And uh, no, 18 years. And and yet we still have our government officials are determined to not make it work and to stigmatize people. And when we were in Uruguay, there was a lot of discussion about how they want to avoid uh, stigmatization. They want to make it available and they want to have it readily accessible. They want to, you know, uh, get the criminals out of the market and bring it above ground. And, and moreover, they were talking about this is an opportunity on the medical marijuana area in particular where they can head the world in research because because if they have a regulated system for non-medical use, that people will have access. And if they're controlling the strains, that means that they will be able to do medical research without bringing in the pharmaceutical companies to do the work for them, that just people buying their own and doctors keeping track of who's using what and how it's working and benefiting them, that they can create a, a national database on medical marijuana and, and uh, cost-effective in a way that keeps the pharmaceutical drug companies out. And I, and I think the pharmaceutical companies are probably not happy to hear that, but uh, I think from the point of view of the citizenry, it's a fantastic idea that they can actually get straight to the research without having to worry about you know, the DEA uh, overturning it or the drug companies not being able to profit enough to be worth their time, et cetera, et cetera. Well, speaking um, of time, I got to jump in here. It is time to wrap it up, so let's give shout-outs, please, to starting with our guest, the West Coast Leaf, and y'all, and your show, and all the hard work you're doing. Yeah, Leaf Radio uh, every Monday at four o'clock. Uh, the Leaf Online is our news site, and uh, of course, I have to invite everybody to come to Oxidam University. You want to learn about the industry and uh, how to make money and how to do things right. Uh, OxidamUniversity.com. Mickey. Yeah. By the way, it's the LeafOnline.com, where people can get their latest news. Uh, took over from our West Coast Leaf print edition. And uh, check out CannabisConsumers.org. Um, you know, there, there's just so many. And now we have a, a new blog, right? Right, Casper, for the uh, Time for Hemp? Well, it is a news zine. When you print it out, and it looks beautiful if you want to. And we keep it down to about 20 pages or less. So if people want to print it out, it doesn't cost very much at all per issue, as we say in Indiana. It also looks fantastic on your handheld devices, iPads, smartphones, and so on. And yes, it's called Joint Conversations, and it's released on the 20th of each month. Oh, very good. And I'd like to also do a, a shout-out to StopTheDrugWar.org. They're, they're one of my favorites go to go to for a weekly drug war chronicle analysis of the latest news and uh, they've been helpful to us with at the leaf online as well and the leaf radio so good for them they've been and, at it a long time and paul paul i think we lost paul in the mountains all right well let me give a shout out for the television <laughs> show that paul and i do on friday nights from 8 to 9 p.m Pacific Standard Time. You can find it on uh, the Portland, Oregon community cable. Then it's, then it's distributed to other community cable shows around the nation and is found on Ustream as well as Cannabis Common Sense. Paul has been the host of that fantastic show 
for about 16, 17 years, and I have been blessed enough to be the joint host on the Friday Night Broadcast for about four years now, and we sure have a lot of fun doing it. If you are in Oregon, please get involved in the signature gathering. That's how we're going to make a difference and make a change. You can find out the information at at hemp.org. It's a great website for not only signing up to help with the initiative, but to get information about what's going on in the marijuana movement. Hey, Casper. Yes, ma'am. Can we give a quick shout out to Mike Lafari show for all our Spanish listeners who uh, might want more information on what's going on in South America? Oh, please do. He's on every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon from high noon Pacific Standard Time to 1 p.m. Okay. And we need to give a shout out to another hardworking activist who is no longer with us, just passed away, actress Ruby D. <laughs> at the age of 91, has passed away. She was a fantastic actress. Many of you got to watch her work in Raisin of the Sun, and she was in so many other films and Broadway productions, won many awards from Tonys to Oscars. But she also, many people aren't aware of, if you only focus on the limelights, uh, that she was a hardworking activist in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and throughout the rest of her life, for equal rights and the civil rights movement, she and her husband, her second husband, Ozzy Davis, uh, were one of the first few people to have an open marriage, and they did so without having any fear or retribution publicly upon their careers. And uh, then she went on to make a change in the world around us. She was honored in 2005, along with her late husband, with the Lifetime Achievement Freedom Award that was presented to her by the National Civil Rights Museum located in Memphis. We are going to miss you, Miss Ruby D. You are an inspiration to many of us who when we get tired and think that maybe, just maybe, it's a little too difficult to keep moving forward to make a difference. We can look at the hard work that you and the people around you did and realize that, yes, one person can get up every day and with enough love and enough moxie change the world. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look and spend some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yes, it's time for him. Whoa, an acre of hemp makes 20 bales of Poison. Oh. 